Last Sunday, I introduced a brand new series that we're calling Decade of Destiny, and, and that was very well received, I thought. Uh, most people that were here would tell you it'd be worth your time uh, to go back and watch that service online. If you missed it, it was a great start. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about your, your health, your wealth, your career, your family, your time, your, your dreams and vision, all the ma major areas of your life. Now, the classic chapter in the Bible about having a dream or having a vision and goals is Genesis chapter 24. So we're going to hang out there today, and I'm going to unpack a story that applies to us all, and it has implications for all of us. Uh, I told you last week I feel like that I've got 10 good years left to be the senior leader of this church, and I want to finish strong. Anybody else? Yeah. I want to make sure that the next 10 years are our best 10 years, and I want to leave a legacy for my children and, and grandchildren and for your children and your grandchildren, uh, a spiritual heritage. And I'm committed to you being the most successful that you can possibly be over the next 10 years of your life. I want your life to be meaningful, significant, and successful. Now, the word success is used five different times in Genesis chapter 24. Uh, it's the story of Abraham and how God promised uh, that he would be the father of a great nation. But he had Isaac, and as time went on, Isaac was a little slow to pull the trigger on getting married. And uh, Abraham was getting old, and he's, he got worried about it. You know, was there ever going to be any grandchildren? Abraham's going, you know, I don't have any grandchildren. Where's my great nation going to come from? So he gets serious, and he sends his servant, a guy named uh, Eleazar, and I'm going to call him Eli because I'm going to mess it up if I don't shorten that a little bit. Uh, and this guy, he's going to send him to Iraq which is, is, by the way, where Abraham came from. And he says, I want you to find a wife. I want you to go to Iraq. I'm going to give you a detailed plan. And I want you to go and find a wife for my son Isaac. And so you're sitting there and you're thinking, so PT, what in the world does Genesis chapter 24 have to do with me today? Well, it has, again, enormous implications for everybody in the room as well as everybody watching online. You see, Eli accepts the mission as Abraham's servant, and he ends up doing stuff on this project that we should do in order to fulfill a goal, reach a dream, or see a vision become a reality in our lives. Now, I still, this is truth about me, and Sylvia will laugh when I say this because it's so true, I still get lost in favor. I lived here 21 years, and I still get lost without a GPS. I'm probably the only guy in town who's lived here 20 years and will still set a GPS to go across town, okay? Uh, the other day, I typed in a destination on Google Maps, and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't giving me directions. The directions wouldn't pop up. Then I realized for, you know, once in a great while, it won't actually pinpoint my starting location. And so if it doesn't have a starting location, it can't map out where that is supposed to take me. And I was waiting, it was waiting for me to tell it where I was starting from. So I had to manually put that in. Well, guess what? And this is so true of us. You can't get to where you want to go if you don't know where you are right now. You need to evaluate where you are. Look at somebody and say, where are you? Where are you? Folks, I'm going to tell you something before I jump into this. If you will listen and you'll take just a few of the application opportunities that I'm going to give you this morning, it will drastically improve the quality of your life. You don't even have to be a believer to apply the principles that I'm going to teach you today, and it will drastically improve the quality of your life. Step number one. Determine your present position. And this is a great sermon to have passed out notes. And I forgot about you. I love you, but I forgot to pass out sermon notes. But you, you get your phone out, and, and uh, I won't think that you're playing on your phone. Take some good notes, and we'll have a good time together. But step one, determine your present position. You've got to know your present position. There are two questions you need to ask yourself. Where am I now, and what would I like to change? What would I like to change? First of all, where am I now? Where am I now financially, emotionally, in my career, relationally, spiritually? Where is my current life location? What is that? Then you want to ask yourself the question, what would I like to change about where I'm at right now? Because once I know what I want to change, it's a lot easier to figure out where I want to go, right? Abraham's thinking, hey, I'm getting old, and my son doesn't have a son. I have no grandchildren. What would I like to change? I'd like to get my son a wife. I want to get him married off. I, Abraham wants grandchildren. I have one, but I should have three by now. So I understand a little bit how Abraham was feeling. I get it. 
So God had promised Abraham he'd be the father of a great nation. But time passes, and he was getting considerably older. In verse 1 of of this chapter, it says, Abraham was now old and well advanced in years. And I, I feel you, brother Abraham. And the Lord had blessed him in every way. Time's running out for Abraham. He says, I better get moving. I'm not going to harp on this point, but listen, folks, this is just it's blunt talk. Plain talk's easily understood, but I want to say it to you. Whatever you intend to do with your life, you need to get on it. You need to get moving. You, need to get, you, need to, you, you better get on it for two good reasons. Number one, everything takes longer than you think. And number two, you may think you're young, but it goes away just like that. Time just flies. You don't, you're you're not getting any younger, and I ain't trying to hurt your feelings. I'm just trying to lump you in the same pile I'm in today to make me feel better about being here. (laughs) Right now, let me tell y'all something. I wasn't gonna say this. I'm standing up here right now with a tens unit working my back. So if you think the spirit hits me, it's just that tens just gave me a little surge. My point is, whatever you're going to do with your life, you better get to it. You better get to it. I I mean, one of these days, I'm going to get around to it, or someday I will. You need to get to it. You need to get on with it. Look at somebody say, get on with it. This series will help you get going in the right direction for the next 10 years of your life. Don't let the next decade just kind of limp along like the last decade. You can either drift with no direction or you can figure out where you are and where you need to be and get on with it. Now, so time is running out for Abraham. He's getting older and Isaac doesn't have a wife. He knows he has to set a goal and he knows he's got to pursue the goal. PT, I'm too old to set a goal. Listen, Abraham was 115 years old when he set and established this goal for his son Isaac. So until you turn 116, you need to be having some goals and visions in your life. You need to have uh, some pursuits. Don't ever stop dreaming. You stop dreaming, you stop living. Without a dream, you drift, and then you're just existing. And I don't want to be that guy. As, you're, as, you're, as, as long as you're breathing, as long as your heart is pumping blood, you should have a dream in your heart. But, but you've got to know where you are before you can chart a course and develop a plan for where that you want to go. Step number two, you need to describe exactly what you want, where you want to go. You need to write it down. Now, listen, this is so important. Why, why do you want to, what do you want to accomplish in the next 10 years? On Sunday, I'm going to give you an example. On Sunday, January the 9th, I'm going to share a detailed vision with you about the next 10 years at Crosspoint under my leadership. Uh, A day of details because unfocused vision is unclear vision, and unclear vision will put you in the ditch. you got to know where you're going. Abraham paints a clear picture for his servant Eli. He tells him what he wants, and he tells him what he doesn't want. Clear vision does that. Verses 3 and 4. He says, and here's the details. He says, don't get a wife for my son from the Canaanite girls who live around here. Instead, go back to my country, to the land of my relatives, and get a wife for my son Isaac. He's saying, I want a wife for my son from the same hometown that will share the same common faith, the same lineage, uh, the same legacy, the same heritage. He's very specific. He's very precise. Now, listen, you will never reach a vague goal. You will never get there. Nothing becomes dynamic until it becomes specific. The more specific you are about the next 10 years, the more compelling it will be. It needs to be clear, it needs to be concise, and it needs to be compelling. Y'all okay out there? It needs to be compelling. Now, for it to be compelling, you've got to answer four questions. Number one, what do I want to be? Number two, what do I want to do? Number three, what do I want to have? And here's a big one. Number four, why do I want it? Why do I want it? Now, listen, when you're thinking about your future, you've got to know more than just what you want in your life. You've got to be able to understand why that you want it in your life. What you want is important, but why you want it will determine your motivation for getting off the couch and mapping out a clear journey to get you from where you are to where you need to be. Every goal should have a reward attached to it. Every every goal that's worthwhile does. 
a payoff. If there's no payoff, your goal won't hold you. It won't captivate you. That's why Jesus talked about rewards in Matthew chapter 5 in one of the greatest pieces of literature known to man. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. You're going to be blessed if you're poor in spirit. How am I going to be blessed? What's the reward? The reward for you would be the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said. He said, blessed are the meek. Oh, I'm going to be blessed. What's the reward in being meek? Oh, it's a great reward. You're going to inherit the earth. Blessed are the pure in heart. What's the reward for that? They shall see God. Every worthwhile goal, every worthwhile vision is going to have a valuable reward attached to it. He said, if you do this, you're going to be rewarded. Jesus understood that there are benefits to living the right way. What what is it that's going to motivate Eli? To go find a wife for Isaac in another country. He's got four motivations. First of all, you know, Isaac is going to get a wife. That's a big deal for them in this culture. Number two, his master Abraham is going to be really pleased with him if he pulls this off. And number three, God's purpose for for Isaac and the next generation and, and the seed that should be as the sands of the sea is going to be accomplished. He wanted to have a part in that. And number four, he's promised to reward himself. He knows not only what he's going to do, but why he's going to do it. The what is not enough. You've got to know why that you do what you do. Now, let me unpack that a little bit more. Listen, when you figure out why you do what you do, God will show you how to get it done. He'll make a way. If he calls you to it, he will see you through it. Come on now. We're always so concerned about the how. How am I going to do it? How am I going to pay for it? Where is the help going to come from to get this thing done? We're always asking, how are we going to make it happen? God says, you need to ask why you're doing it. Because with God, motivation is more important than method. Let me explain that. You figure out the motivation of why you do what you do in life, and God will give you the methodology to get it done. He'll take care of the how it's going to happen. Listen, every time we've cast vision bigger than our ability here at Cross Point Church over the last 18 years since we existed, we had no idea when the vision is that big, you have no idea how you're going to get there. You have no idea how to accomplish any of it. Once we figured out, though, the what and the why, God always provided the how. He always provides the how. He makes a way. Abraham says, hey, I'm getting old. And my son doesn't have a wife. Eli, I want you to go back to my home country, Iraq. And here's what I want and here's what I don't want. He defines and describes in specifics what he's looking for, the kind of girl that he wants for his son. And that was a very common thing in that culture. Verse 5, then the servant asked Abraham, what if? Here's that big thing. Here we go. What if? What if the woman, in other words, the girl that he's going to find for Isaac, what if she's unwilling to leave her home? Here in Iraq, you know, this is her homeland. What if, she, what if she won't come back with me? I'm a total stranger. What if she won't come back to me with me to a foreign land to, to marry a guy that she's never met? Eli, Eli says, what if? What if? In other words, let, let me pose a hypothetical problem that hasn't happened yet, and let's spend some time worrying about something that's not even an issue right now. How many people in the room did I just describe? Come on now. You know this. Worry and fear will paralyze you. It will paralyze you. Worry and fear postpone the vision. Worry and fear will cause you to procrastinate. Worry and fear cause you to put it off. If you start to focus on the negative hypotheticals, you will accomplish nothing in the next 10 years. Don't do it. Don't do that. That's why you need step three, which is the antidote to the natural fears that happen when you start dreaming bigger than your ability. Step three, you need to find a promise from God. You need to find a promise from God. Find a promise from God where God says to you, I'm going to help you with this vision, this dream, this goal. And again, the Bible describes over 7,000 promises from God to you, and every promise has a premise. We talked about it last week. God says, if you do this... The reward will be this. There are are promises of security. There's promises of safety, provision, prosperity. There are promises of success, stability, and strength. Promises of wisdom. Most people go through life and they never claim any of the promises of God. I don't want Cross Point to be that church. Listen, find a promise from God that relates to your life, 
that you can hold on to for hope in tough times, for every goal or dream or vision in your life, and claim it and stand on it in the name of Jesus. And yes, problems are going to come up if you do something bigger than your ability. They always do. But you need to focus on the promise, not the problem. If you focus on the problem, you'll never get to the provision. Man, you know, we thought when we closed on this eight acres that the biggest chunk of our problem would be over and we could just clear it and everything would work out fine. I ain't never seen such a mess in all my life. <laughs> we, got, we got neighbors that's buried critters on, on that property that's upset, worried we're going to fence it off so they can't visit their graves of their dogs. And we got people calling and saying, this property, this survey ain't right. And, and I, I'm telling Denton, just keep clearing that land, brother. Just keep clearing that land. All kind of problems. Every time you try to do something, we got, we got a vision for that every inch of that land over there. Yeah. Every inch of it. And, and, and you know, I'm, I, it's been such, oh, my God, it's been an aggravating week. I, Lord Jesus, help me not to say anything ugly from the pulpit today. But I told Marissa, I said, do not forward one more of those phone calls to me. I ain't talking to nobody else about it until I cool off a little bit. People don't want you to use your land. They want you to just give it to them. I'm like, what in the world? I've never in all my life. I need to finish this sermon and get back, you know, in the spirit here. But, you know, anything that you have that you're going to do for God, expect there to be problems. There's going to be problems that arise. You try to resolve all that and give, give God the glory and let God take you where you can't go on your own and he will help you to rise above it and eventually, I know this, everything will work out and everybody will be fine and we'll all just continue to be great neighbors and love each other and do the right thing. But right now, we've got to keep our eyes on the promise and God will take care of the provision. God will make a way where the, there, there seems to be no way. Oh, but what if she won't come with me? He says, son, go find, go find, Eli, go find my son a wife. She's coming home with you because God never breaks a promise. Verse 7, Abraham said, the Lord brought me from the land of my relatives to this land, and he solemnly promised me that he would give this land to my descendants. Abraham is, is not letting go of God's promise. He's holding on. So he will. He said, he will. He's standing on his promise now. It's not, I think he might. He says, he will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife there for my son. Now, you may not feel God's presence, but there is never a time when God is not with you. Matter of fact, God is already in your future. He's waiting on you to get there. He's already there. He knows everything that's going to happen in your future. If God is with you, and he is, it should encourage you to dream big, to take care of the what and the why, and God will go before you and take care of the how. Y'all okay out there? As a Jesus follower, I cast vision based on God's ability, not mine. On God's promises, not my ability. So don't focus on, on, on the problem. Focus on the promise. Find your promise and hold on to hope. If God made a promise that relates to your journey, I, just stand on it against all odds and trust him to bring it to pass. Stand on the promises of God. Step number four, ask God for help. Verse 12, then Eli prayed, O Lord God of my master Abraham, give me success and show this kindness to my master. Abraham, help me to accomplish the purpose of my journey. Now listen to me real closely because this is one that in a lot of churches we just kind of skip right over and we don't, we don't spend enough time here. We need to camp out here for a moment. When your success in this life helps it others and it honors God, you need to pray persistently about it because God wants you to help others and he wants you to honor him. So, so don't be timid. Don't, don't wonder, you know, I've had people say, you know, is it right to pray for success in this life? Of course it is. If it helps other people and it honors God. So don't be timid. Ask God, Lord, give me success. Help me to be what you want me to be so that I can be a blessing to others and honor you in the process. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 4, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and it's talking about when we pray, and there we'll receive his mercy, and we'll find grace to help us. Ask God to help you. When we need it. So you need to pray. Eli continually prays through this mission that Abraham is sending him on. In verse 12, and I don't have time to break all this down, but in verse 12, he prays before he starts out. In verse 15, he prays after he arrives in Iraq. In verse 52, he prays in front of Rebecca's family that he's about to try to convince to let her come back to a foreign land and marry Isaac, some guy that she's never laid eyes on before. 
My question is simple. Are you praying about your goals, your dreams, your vision? Are you talking to God about these things? Your prayer life reveals two things about you, and I'm talking mainly to the Christians in the room. It reveals how serious you are about your dreams. That's the first thing. If you're not asking God for this to happen in your life, you don't really care about it that much. Let me explain that. It's not a real deep desire. You, you, just, you may just be chasing a whim. I'll put it in terms you can understand. Sometimes, not sometimes, at least once a week, me and Lennox go to Target or Walmart. And there's a certain section. He knows how to get there. You, he don't like to ride in the buggy very much anymore. He's looking at me intently. Uh, he's sitting in with us in this service. But uh, sometimes he says, let me walk, Papa, and then he'll get out in front of the buggy, and he beats me to a, a certain department in the store. Do y'all know what it is? The toy department. And so he gets there, and uh, I catch up a little bit, and uh, the very first aisle, there's always something on the first aisle that's worth about 75 cents, and they got it priced at 8 or $9. He wants it. I know that it's not going to last till he gets to the truck. And so I will say, hey, Lynn, let's keep looking. And he, he goes, I want this, Papa. Let's just see if there's anything else. We take the next turn, get to the next row, and he finds something better. He don't even mention the 75-cent little, little toy that you know ain't going to last a day. You know why? Because it was a whim. It was just a whim. It wasn't a deep desire of his heart. Now, every time Lennox comes to my house, he tells me about he's watching me intently because he knows there's something in this for him. Me and you tight. You my best friend, Lynn? Yeah, my best friend. He comes to my house and he says, uh, this is this uh, dinosaur thing that's remote and it's not cheap. It's high dollar. And he has not let it go. It's been a consistent uh, thing that we've talked about every week for a number of weeks now. Papa, am I going to get this for Christmas? You sure are, Booger Bear. You're going to get it for Christmas. Folks, it's already sitting in my Amazon cart right now, okay? I'm waiting for my allowance to build up a little bit, and then I'll place the order when Sylvie gives me the green light because really, she's in control. I just live with her, okay? So that's just kind of how it goes. <laughs> I get a little money, and she says, you have any change left over from that money I gave you? Yeah, here, you can have it back. <laughs> Likewise, folks, if you pray and you say, God, I want you to give me this, help me to become this, help me to do this, and you only, you only hit God up for that one time, and, and then you move on, it was just a whim. It wasn't a deep desire of your heart not a really deep desire. And I believe sometimes that God delays answering our prayers to see if we're serious or if what we're asking for is just another whim. But, but then, you know, it's something you're just going to forget about the next day. If you don't care enough to pray about it more than once, God is like, that's obviously not a deep desire. That's just a whim. So you need to persistently pray about the things, the visions, the dreams, the goals that are birthed in your heart. If you want to get from point A to point B, you need to hang in there and be persistent about your goals. Step number five, identify the barriers. What's keeping you from reaching your desired destination? You've got to identify the, the barriers because you can't get past them if you don't know what they are, right? Maybe it's relational problems you need to resolve in your marriage or, or with your boyfriend or girlfriend or your parents. It could be financial barriers that, that have to be resolved, educational barriers or a lesson to learn before God can uh, allow a blessing in your life like that and give it to you. Maybe it's emotional barriers that's keeping you from your dream. A lot of people in our culture today, it's surprising to me, so, uh, they struggle with self-esteem issues and they don't think they deserve anything in this life. So they just kind of get out there and they self-sabotage their dreams and their goals and, you know, give up way too quick like, ah, you know, I, I don't deserve that mentality. In, in this story, Eli faces several seemingly impossible barriers. Now think about this. First, he's got to go to a country that he's never been to and he's got to find his way there. They didn't have GPS back then, right? I can't find my way back to the places that I have been most of the time and he's got to go and find his way to a place he's never been to. In verse 21, he has the problem of finding the right girl. And then in verse 58, the problem of getting the girl's consent. And then in verse 49, the problem of getting the parents' consent. There's a phrase for this, mission impossible. Mission impossible. 
You're going to come knock on my door and say that, you know, my, my, my master sent me here to tell your daughter that she's supposed to come back to a foreign land and marry a man she's never seen? I'm going to hurt you, right? That's not going to happen. So, and, and, and surely this was a mission impossible for him. You need to identify and write down the barriers that are keeping you from, from where that you want to go or who you want to be financially, educationally, emotionally, relationally. Faith, look, let me say this. Faith does not deny reality. Faith does not deny reality. Faith says, yes, I see the problem, but I believe God is bigger than the problem. I believe God is bigger. Number six, step number six, create a step-by-step plan. That's what Eli did. It's what you need to do to reach your vision, your goal, your destiny. You've got to have a plan for one step at a time. It's not one giant leap. A lot of people mess this up, but it's not a giant leap. You take it one step at a time. Don't try to do it all at once. Spread it out. And somebody's sitting there thinking, PT, this is a lot of work. you got a lot of steps, and we ain't done yet. That's a lot of work, man, all this planning. You're right. And you don't have to do it, okay? You can walk out of here and check out of this conversation and, and apply none of this to your life. That's your choice. You can drift through the next decade and, and let it be just like the last one. A recent Harvard study showed, and I, I found this fascinating, that 95% of Americans do not have any written-down goals. 95%. Only 5% of Americans do what I'm talking to you about right now. They have written down visible, specific goals. But listen to this. They followed up with this. Those, the same 5% that write their goals down happen to be the 5% of the highest earners in America according to the same Harvard study. That's compelling to me. You don't have to do any of this. But is the next 10 years of your life worth a few hours of planning and praying and giving some serious thought to what the next 10 years are supposed to look like? Yes, it is. Y'all with me? Step seven, be patient and persistent. You've got to be patient and persistent because this isn't going to happen overnight. If it's a big, big vision and a big goal, it's not just going to you know, be like flipping on a light switch. The bigger your goal, the longer it's going to take. The more significant your goal, the more time and energy is going to be involved. It takes time and it takes discipline. And again, set goals and vision bigger than your ability because that always gives God room to show up and work in your life. Yeah. Undeniable when God shows up. If, you, if I just set visions and goals and we say, hey, you know, we're going to buy a van for Don, we can do that without God's help. We can just do that on our own. You know, because we've got the money. The money's sitting in them there. Cha- There's gold in them there, chairs. It's just a matter of whether or not you want to give it, right? So, I mean, I can motivate you and I can cast vision and encourage you to get on board. We did that this past year and we cast a vision bigger than our ability. We said, hey, what if we could raise $200,000? Actually, it started like this in the boardroom. I said, well, let's do something catchy, a slogan, and let's, let's say two hundred k by Independence Day. And when we got to staff meeting, we all said two hundred k and we kind of chuckled. And I looked at my staff and I said, yeah, we kind of laughed. I said, okay, we, we know it's not likely. Let's cast that vision anyway. And what if we raise $60,000? Won't that be wonderful? We cast vision much bigger than our ability for a three-month time frame based on the amount of people that were coming to our church at the time. And we raised $227,000. You know how that happened? God, we gave God room to work. He said, you ain't going to get there on your own, but watch what I can do. I'm going to show up and do something incredible. Always cast vision bigger than your ability, and God will show up with the how. Amen? He'll make it happen. So vitally, vitally important. So be consistent with that. Set goals bigger than your ability. That's why we're calling this uh, the decade of destiny. You've got to have patience to get there. It's not the day of destiny. It's the decade of destiny. Eli did this. Verse 21 shows he was patient. Verse 33 shows he was persistent. And here's my point. For you to reach your goal, you're going to have to learn how to, to, to delay gratification. It's going to get real quiet in here, okay? Just a, a preface for you. Most Americans have no concept of delayed gratification. It's the reason why our, why our entire nation is in debt. It's the reason why our government is so screwed up and in debt. Every time we buy something on credit, we're pursuing instant gratification. 
I, I don't want to save for it. I want it right now. You're, you're buying something that you can't afford with somebody else's money. Uh, Dave Ramsey could preach this part of this sermon a whole lot better than me. But credit is the number one example of our inability to put off pleasure until we can afford it, until we can save for something and afford it. Unsuccessful people make decisions in the moment based on a feeling. They, they don't do the, the right thing because they don't feel like doing the right thing. Successful people know how to delay gratification. Again, Ramsey is famous for saying, pay now, play later. I believe Dave is right. Now, I don't always get it right. My wife wishes I would, okay? But a lot of us will, will fall for this, and we like to play now and pay later. If we have a problem with delayed gratification, let me give you a verse that you ought to hold on to. Here's your first promise. You can hold on to this one for your vision or for your dream. As God is speaking here, this is what it says. He says, these things I plan. In other words, God says, I got some great things planned for your life. Big finish. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? You're going to get out of here early. Are you excited? Yeah, there's a cup of coffee waiting for you in the lobby. Here's the first promise. I've got these things I plan, these, things, these huge plans I've got for your life, won't happen right away. Really? Slowly, steadily, surely the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair, for these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. It will come to you in God's time if you'll pursue and walk in the will of God for your life. Step eight, you've got to enlist a team for support. You're never going to reach your own goal or your goal on your own. You're just not going to get there. Uh, you're never going to fulfill your vision by yourself. Success is never, never a one-man show. You've got to involve other people. It takes teamwork. It takes cooperation. Eli does this when he's trying to facilitate this request of Abraham. He enlists everybody he can for this mission he's trying to carry out. He gets the parents involved. He gets her family involved, her brother, he, the relatives, other relatives outside of the, the home involved, and all this for support. Here, here's what you need to remember. If you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, take a bunch of people with you. Come on now. Some people, uh, you know, used to kid me when uh, other preachers would get in the pulpit and they would preach better than me. And, you know, and, and it's true. This, this happens all the time. You know, I, the sun is setting <laughs> for me. And, and I understand. I'm going to finish strong, though. Y'all hear me? <laughs> I'm going to finish strong. Come hell to high water, I'm finishing strong. But these young guys coming on, Mike and Josh, and every preacher that I've had, you know, they all have abilities that I don't have. And I used to tell that people would come to me and they'd say, man, them boys out preaching you. And I'd say, I didn't go, what do you mean? Well, they ain't never getting back in my pulpit. I ain't going to have nobody here doing better than me. Nah, -uh, right? that's not my attitude. You know what I'm thinking to myself? I train these boys. <laughs> you know why they can preach with no notes? Because I wouldn't let them start preaching with notes. That's right. I tell them, don't use notes. Don't be like me. You know, my mind's not as sharp as it used to be. Y'all's minds are sharp. You need to make contact and communicate with the people. And I'm pouring into them every chance I got. And, and when they first started preaching, they wasn't as good as me. <laughs> they wouldn't have. Yeah, they're better now. But they didn't start like that. They, they couldn't preach their way out of a wet paper bag when they first started. <laughs> But man, look what God has done. And I'm never going to steal the glory that belongs to the team. If you want to grow an organization, you quit trying to take credit for everything and you start sharing it with everybody that's actually helping you get the job done. You know why that we have such incredible, phenomenal worship? Look, anybody can stand up here on this team and fill this pulpit and do what I do, but there's a whole team of people that put the music together. They are working on it all the time. There's people out in Kids Point making that... Uh, environment phenomenal there's people in the lobby making the phenomenal environment there as you come in there's people in the parking lot welcoming first time it's not a one-man show you want to go fast and, and, and burn out quick try to take credit for everything but if you want to go far and get something done that has eternal value bring you a team together i've got a phenomenal team bring you a team together and god will do great things in your life amen the Bible says one person standing alone is easily attacked and defeated. 
Defeated people give up on their dreams. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three people are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. And then the last one, a lot of steps in this plan. Step nine, you must pay a price. You got to pay the price. There's a cost associated with reaching a goal. Never desire the success of another person without first finding up, finding out what they gave up to have their success. You start asking for that kind of success, God says, okay, I'm going to send you on the same journey they went on to get there. A lot of people give up quick. I have pastors, young ministers that have called me, see if you can vouch for this, all through the years when they heard Crosspoint was finally taking off and doing a little something, making a difference in the world, and they kind of got on this thing where they wanted to start a church, and uh, they would call and say, you know, I'm thinking about planting a church. And I, I was like, oh, Lord, are you sure God's calling you to plant a church? Because it's going to be the biggest challenge of your life. Well, you know, I, I see what God's done at Crosspoint, but yeah, yeah, I understand. But you need to understand the cost, the price that was paid to get us from where we were, uh, a group of four people, to now a, a church of over 1,000 people. How does that happen? It don't just all of a sudden happen one day. Somebody paid a, a heavy price for that. There was a pastor somewhere down the line, just a couple of little tidbits, that lived in the church auditorium. For, for three months because he didn't have a house to live in to keep the doors of the church open, okay? I mean, some, some folks ain't going to want to live in the church and pay that kind of price. One morning, we had a daycare. This is not in my notes, but this is a fun story. We had a daycare. Alyssa, I'm going to tell this story again. And, and Alyssa was dropping Caitlin off. Caitlin's a little bitty thing. Wave at me, Caitlin. Ain't she pretty? I've watched her grow up from a little bitty girl. Anyway, she's dropping Caitlin off at the daycare, and nobody at the church knew we were living there. We didn't have a house anymore. We, we give up the house in order to continue to pay the payments on the church. A lot of people won't do that. You know, they ain't going to do it. So Micah <laughs> didn't realize what time it was. We're all sleeping in a corner in the main auditorium, and he gets up in his boxers, and he walks out of the auditorium, and there's Alyssa coming in the front doors of the church to drop Caitlin off. And she's like, Micah, you know, what's going on? I mean, imagine this scene. The boy's walking half naked through the church. What are you doing? What's, what's happening here? You know, some people ain't going to make that sacrifice, right? I mean, it just ain't going to happen. We did talk to the boy. We did ask him to cover up whenever you got to go outside of this room, you know, when, when daycare's going on, and we fix the problem. You address problems as they come up. You remember that? <laughs> Good times. Some folks ain't going to pay that price. So before you start trying to emulate somebody else's su success, you better, you better consider the price they paid to have it. Candy, I bet you could say amen to that, couldn't you? Any sacrifices and, and doing what you do as a broker and training all these other... Good Lord, you ought to talk to people that are successful in business because it, that success didn't just pop up overnight. There's a price to pay for it, man. you got to be willing. That's why you got to know where you want to go and, and make sure that it's not just a whim. Eli had to pay a price to get Rebecca to go back with him. Verse 53, then he gave Rebecca gold and silver. He's going to bribe her with jewelry and clothes the way to a woman's heart. He also gave expensive gifts to her brother and, and, and mother, smart guy. Big goals, big visions require great sacrifice, a great sacrifice of time, of money, of energy, of reputation. A lot of people only want to be successful if it's convenient. They only want to reach their dream, their goal, if they can get there by working it in their spare time. But if you're serious about making the next 10 years of your life the best decade of your life so far, you're going to have to pay the price. There's a cost for reaching a goal. There is a cost for reaching a goal. The good news for you is that there's only one thing in life, as we know it as Jesus followers, it's free, and that's the salvation that he already paid for us on the cross when he gave up his life. Man, what a powerful thing. A lot of people want success, and they want to live that element of success, but they they're not willing to pay the price. But Jesus dying on the cross was no whim. He knew what he was doing. He went there willingly, and he gave up his life for you. If you're serious about it, if you want to make the next 10 years the best 10 years, you've got to be willing 
to sacrifice. Jesus died on the cross so that you could be forgiven of your sins. And of course I'm going to end this this way. Of course I'm going to give you an invitation to pray. But he did it so that you could be forgiven of your sins without having to pay for the penalty of your sin. He took care of that for you. And so here's what I would always say to you as often as I possibly can. Why not lean into faith today and receive the free gift of salvation? He made it possible for you. He made it possible for me. It's the greatest life you could live is to lean into faith and explore the journey of a lifetime. He wants you to be successful. He wants you to pray for success. He wants you to pursue it persistently and believe that he will provide it. You take care of the what and the why, and he'll facilitate the how. That's what he's all about. He wants you to be successful. If you lean into your faith and walk in God's will for your life, those 7,000 promises that I've mentioned several times in this series already are there for the taking, and you can walk in the will of God and experience his blessing and his favor. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will move into this room today and that you'll speak to the hearts of the people. Help us, God, to lean into our faith and know when we walk out of here today that we've done everything that we could. Lord, to to trust you with the details of our life, the specifics, our goals, our dreams, our vision. And Lord, some people are surely going to just stay stuck where they are with no motivation to change their life and get on the right path. But help us, God, to reach higher and to go further not necessarily faster, but to go further with a team of people that are difference makers in this world and in this life. I pray in Jesus' name for every person in this room. Lord, motivation is is a hard thing to get started in our life. It's a hard thing, Lord, to to create new habits and, and, Father, to initiate discipline in our life. But that's where success begins. And, Lord, the first step for every person in this room, if there's someone that has not leaned into faith, is to open their heart and invite you to come and be the motivator of their life. I pray in Jesus' name someone will respond today and someone will invite Jesus Christ to come into their heart and life, asking forgiveness for past flops, failures, and fumbles, and leaning into faith and trusting you for the next decade to be the best season of our lives. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, every person in the room, this is your opportunity to take the first step. We've had people take this step every week over the last six or eight weeks, and it's been phenomenal to see people come to faith in Jesus. You can be counted in that number of people that have decided to follow Jesus and have those blessings and those promises materialize in your life. Father, let it happen today. Would you pray this prayer after me? Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner, and I desperately need a Savior. I ask for forgiveness of my sin, and I invite you into my heart and into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross so that I could live and know the power of a loving God. Thank you for saving me today. I give my life and my heart to you. In Jesus' name, amen.